Alright, a very good morning Twitch fans from Captain Nabs. Welcome back to the Twitch stream channel here and welcome to all you viewers on uh, YouTube as well. It's been a while since I've had a chance to get a stream in. Uh, just things kept getting in the way. Unfortunately, uh, I had one opportunity. I actually did try it. I got about an hour in and uh, of course uh, the 3.30 crashed on me. So we're going to try it one more time here, and if this one is not successful, I think we might have to just skip these trips to uh, Nice and back, but we're going to try it here. So welcome again, guys, to uh, A Pilot's Life here on uh, the Captain Nab's channel. As you can see today, we are still working for Air Transat. We've got the good old A330 booted up, which means we are doing some long haul, and that's right, we're lugging this beast all the way across the Atlantic. We're starting off here, for those of you that don't recognize it, maybe from the hangar in the background on the left there, or the arrow key right up uh, in the middle there, but we are here uh, at Montreal, and actually if you look carefully, even on the right, very right side of the screen there, it actually says it on the old control tower, it says Montreal. So uh, we are here in Montreal doing that uh, flight over to Nice, another episode of A Pilot's Life here. Uh, as you can see in my uh, current status, I've got uh, just a little bit of time left to go before my next promotion, and I've only got two flights left to go on this uh, next leg here, going just to Nice and back, and once we get back to Montreal, this leg is done, and then we're going to have an evaluation of where we stand with uh, A Pilot's Life here. I've really enjoyed the stream. Uh, I think you guys have too, but I feel like it's become uh, maybe a bit repetitive, a bit... Uh, it's definitely lost a lot of interest with a lot of people. I haven't seen nearly as many people watching these videos as we're watching it in the beginning, although it does surprise me every once in a while that I do get a video that gets watched a lot. So, uh, just selecting the aircraft here that we're going to fly, CGTSO is the aircraft with the livery we've got. Um, so we may reevaluate and we may try to do something different in the future with our streaming. I definitely want to keep up Twitch streaming, but I may put a little bit of a hiatus on the pilot's life career and just try some other things as well. Maybe try to make more use of Microsoft Flight Simulator again because it just seems like these videos, uh, these pilot's life videos have become a little bit... Uh, uh, just just repetitive. It, it's, it's the same thing over and over again. You, you guys have enjoyed it. You really have, but uh, like I said, I just think uh, maybe the channel wants something a little fresher. But until we get to that point, we've still got two more flights to do. So let's get them underway. we got uh, lots to do. I want to be airborne here in about uh, 25 to 30 minutes. we got lots to do to get to that point. And of course, as always, I'm going to have FS2 crew helping me out here. And let's just quickly make sure we got everything set here. External power. Uh, we really don't even want to have 45 minutes, but we'll put 45 minutes down. And uh, we'll just leave it as the default one because I haven't even heard that one in a while. Hi there, Captain. How are you today? I am good. It's just a little bit farther up, so it's not too far in the way. He's going to start the airplane, I hope. Uh, and we will, in the meantime, start the most important thing here, which is to start the fueling of the airplane because this is what takes the longest to do in this airplane. So let me pull up my flight plan here really quickly on the other screen, see what my block fuel is. 47.4, so we'll round that up to 47.6, because this is the thing that takes the longest. And ergo, it has to start right away. Even then, I find still, we're often waiting for it. So I've called for the fuel truck already, we've got the fuel load set. While we have this up, we're going to set the rest of the numbers here, just based on what was... Uh, Set up in the Simbri flight plan here, 296, and cargo of, we'll say, uh, we'll say three tons of cargo here. All right, and that's ready to go when we start calling for boarding. And now he's doing some of the power-up stuff here. Whoa, 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 whoa. That was a little uh, out of whack there. He's got the external power on, but he hasn't turned on the dome light to help us at all, or any of the other lighting for that matter. Uh, so let's get those. Yeah, no, the instrument lighting is on. Why am I not? Oh, there it is. He just, just did it, I guess. Alright, so we have to make sure we get the ADIRSs on. We can do the fire test if we want. It didn't work before, but uh, Aerosoft has issued a couple of Airbus updates since the last time I think I streamed this. And they fixed that fire siren. That fire siren was broken. It would only just beep once, and that was it. And that was a little weird. So now it's back to repeating, which is good. 
armor those, and we'll get the portable electronic signs on. And, uh, yeah, I think oh, we need that. Yeah, nav light, logo light, they're all on. Yep, good. Alright, parking brake is set. He's got that set. I, uh, I'm not even sure if I have this thing properly set up in twin mode. I do. Yeah, yeah, I do. I just, uh, it's been a while since I've done much simming outside of Microsoft Flight Simulator, so I don't even know necessarily what's set up in here. But there we go. I think we got it all set up now. Uh, yeah. So, uh, without further ado, we're going to hop into the Arc Do. We're going to fast forward this. Oop, not that. Okay, I'm out for the walk around. I'm back from the walk around. <laughs> Everything looks good. <laughs> I had to fast forward it because otherwise this will just take forever to get this done. All right, hopefully the fuel truck has showed up. Uh, he should be on his way if he's not here already. Oh, I think, is that him there? Yeah, that's him there. So he's going to start uh, fueling momentarily. And then uh, I think we're all good. Okay, um, so yeah, so we're going to hop right into the FMS to get this whole thing started. As always, we're going to do it with my AviWorks FMS because I really like that system. Really find it's very useful. And... Uh, so let me just bring that up on my other screen really quickly here, and I'm going to stop moving this around so much here. There's my FMS on the other screen there. For some reason... It only seems to... Hmm. Seems to be some lag with my webcam there that I've never seen before. There we go. Never seen that before. For some reason, it uh, there. That seems to work better. That that was very strange. Never seen that before. All right, so we're gonna go into our flight plan here. We've got it loaded up in in here, so we can put everything into our FMS nicely. Uh, so we'll start with the init page. Uh, we are doing today C Y U L two. L F M N, and we do have our flight plan right there. I'm going to take the shortcut and just load it directly because I don't want to spend a whole lot of time typing it in today, because I already typed it in once on the previous attempt to do this flight. Uh, so we'll put in some other information, however. Uh, our alternate, yeah. Uh, Our alternate is not the alternate I originally wanted. I might change this really quickly because I like to try and have alternates that I actually do have the scenery, especially when I do these streams, just in case we end up there. So let's see, I'm going to regenerate this and see if I actually need more fuel. So Barcelona is supposed to be the alternate. Transat 648 is the flight number, and uh, we're going to do Iris and it. Uh, that is going to increase our block fuel a little bit here, so let's just make sure we are going to load enough. It's now 50.8, so we'll do, uh, we'll just round it right up to 51. And it is actually fueling. If you look there in the fuel column, it's flashing green, and it is actually increasing. So the fuel is pumping right now, which is good, because it's going to take a while to pump enough fuel in here to get us all the way to uh, Europe, especially considering it starts with usually about 7,000 kilo, 7, kilos in the tanks. Okay, so that's better. All right, so uh, back to this. Cost index of 100 today. And we may even bump that up even more if that 51,000 will allow us because we want to get there. We really do. Uh, it's a long stream. I'd like to keep this one going. We do have a heck of a tailwind, though, uh, averaging 83 knots. So uh, that'll definitely help push us there anyways. All right. Uh, so the init page looks good. Uh, flight plan page. So we have to, of course, set up our departure. Just going to have to check the weather here in Montreal. Hey, Captain. The agents want to start sending people out. Can we start boarding? Yes. Okay. I'll let them know. 
and that's a sign to call GSX and ask them to start boarding. Alright, so now the GSX is going to start boarding Montreal. The winds are at 280 at 7, so it's going to be departure off 24 left on the Montreal 1 departure. And if we fast forward through to page 2 here, our flight plan route, you see it ends with the Nissar 6 Sierra. And we should actually go through this and just make sure that everything is there. So Antag, Obron, Mobub, Ebmos, uh, Quebec, Sifu, Ye, Rickel. And then we do a cross nat track Yankee. So let's fast forward down to Yankee's description here and make sure all the points are in there, which should be right about here. No, one more page. There it is, Yankee. Uh, so Rickle, we go 5350, 5340, 5330, 5320, Mallet, and Gisty. There we go, that's it. Back up to our routing. Uh, where is it here? There it is. Uh, yeah, so then after Gisty, we go Takas and November 491. Takas, November 491, till we get to. Uh, Moses, then UN 491 to Decor. Then uh, UN 512 to B Rad, UN 490 to Turpo. And you can see the UN 490. It's very small to see, but it is in these small little letters here. You can see the actual airways listed. So there's Turku. Um, no, sorry, to Turpo. And then we do UM 616 to Bebix. There we are. Then UP 860 to Adika. And UZ 161 to Lurga. Then UY 30 to Latam. UY 22 to Nisar. There it is. And then we just need to add the arrival here at the very end. Uh, so right now, for right. Uh, there is Nihilus to four right, so we'll plan that one right now. And the transition is the knee, Nisar 6 Sierra is the plan right now. We can always change that later, but at least we've got it in the system for vertical planning and all that good stuff. And there we go. We do have a flight plan discontinuity still showing in there because the Montreal 1 departure is a radar vector departure, and you're going vector, to get vectored on course that first fix. Uh, we do have to tell GSX to start boarding 296 passengers, and I think we're good. That is the flight plan. I'm uh, just going to hop outside for one second here. Okay, so he's fueling. That's good. Uh, he's, they're not going to start loading baggage until he's done fueling. That's right. So, as annoying as that is. All right, so uh, in at page two. And uh, so ZFW, again, we can steal from, oop, not that one, this one. Ah, so we're staying 155.2. Double tap too quickly and it doesn't want to come out there. And like I said, we're going to block now 51. And there we go, it automatically calculates all the rest of the fuel, the reserve, the alternate time, final fuel and all that stuff. And then finally, we're going to do performance page here. So uh, we're going to do a flaps. Uh, well, not flaps, three departure, eight flaps. One departure. And there we go. And it's going to do uh, 41 degrees flux takeoff, 35, 35, and 43. And that's it. We're now done with the FMS. So I can go ahead and shut that down. Close that all down for now. Eyes front again. And uh, so what did I say? 143 for the the speed here. Actually, what am I doing? We're in a... We're not in a Boeing. We're in an Airbus. It's going to fly that speed automatically. Just have to put this all into manage mode, auto thrust. Got to set the altimeter here, which was uh, 3021. There we go, 3021. See how that fueling is doing here. Twenty-eight thousand six hundred. See, we still have 
another 23,000 kilos to go, so he's about half done fueling. You really, when you're doing fueling these long hauls with uh, GSX, you really got to start early with that fuel. It takes a long time to pump 50-something tons of fuel. You'd need multiple trucks if you're doing it out of a truck, usually. All right, uh, so we've got that all set up. And I think we're just about good to go. We're just going to make sure we have the Unicom frequency. We're going to say, yeah, 2000 for the transponder code. I think we're all good to go here. All right. So he's back in the flight deck. So let us ask, are you ready for the takeoff briefing? Ready. We're going to go back here again. All right, and so the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to do the engine failure procedure. Uh, for any abnormalities or other problems during taxi, we'll stop. Otherwise, this will be a left seat takeoff. Any malfunctions prior to the V1 of uh, of uh, 135, I'll call stop or go. If the call is stop, I'll close the thrust levers, apply maximum brake, disconnect the auto throttle, apply maximum first, and stop on the runway. I will. Uh, Set the parking brake, PA, remain seated, remain seated, and call for any required memory items or QRH checklists. Uh, the actual departure today, we're going to use our charts here because we got them working. Uh, but we don't have anything saved, so let's bring it up really quickly here. C-Y-U-L. Enter. We'll save some of this stuff because it'll be useful again. Uh, there's only one SID in Montreal, so we might as well add that one to the knee board. Uh... Airport info, we can absolutely add that to the knee board. Parking spots and coordinates, we can add that to the knee board. And we got everything we need in one place here. So, uh, we are parked over here at gate uh, 57 or 59. I forget which one we're at. Checking the pushback here anyways. I think we're at 59. Uh, so we're going to push back from gate 59. We're going to probably taxi out the north ramp, Alpha 4, or yeah, Alpha 4 and Alpha. Alpha 4, Alpha, crossing runway 28 to get all the way to threshold 24 left. The only hot spots here, crossing runway 28. Make sure we are aware of the hold short points. Some of them are a little, little farther back than standard. Once we get to 24 left, we're going to be on the Montreal 1 departure. It's a straight up vector SID. 10-370 um, of May 2019. 100 miles safe within 1,000 is 74. Caught departure airborne unless otherwise indicated by ATC and... Uh, 24 left. Climb heading 237 is assigned for vectors the assigned route, unless it was assigned by CC. Maintain 5,000. We got 5,000 feet, and we got everything already ready to be flown in LNAV mode. Uh, terrain, the highest MSA around here is 3,300. The, the airport is solidly within the 3,000 sector. Anyways, weather is, uh, seems like a nice day out there. Uh, yeah, Cav okay. 3 degrees, it's a little cool, but that's what you get this time of year. And uh, I'm going to just put this in night mode. And all I gotta do is just reselect that. Operational, I've got uh, no NOTAMs that I saw, no MELs. Actually, I should check the NOTAMs again. We got time because we're still boarding and we're still boarding our fuel. Um, noise abatements, no turns below 3,000 out of Montreal. So let's go to. Let's just go straight up to NOTAMs here. There we go. Um. So runway, again, the only thing is we've really got uh, two, four, left. Oh, two, four, two, four right is close. Yeah, two, four right is close. That's why we use two, four left for departure. And that's about it. Nothing for the SID. So pretty straightforward there. That's all I've got. And that's pretty much all we can do until everybody is done boarding. So still boarding fuel. How are we doing now with fuel? Because we got to get this... Uh, Boarded uh, 76,000 pounds, and that uh, adds up to 41,000. He's got 10,000 pounds to go, and then we're ready to push back off the gate. So we might be about 10 minutes later than I had hoped, I think, getting this whole process underway, but not too bad, I think. But I believe we're all set up to go. We got the stream going. I th if anybody's watching, thank you so much for watching. We're just getting ready for our departure out of Montreal here. We're just basically the biggest thing we're waiting for now. We're boarding people. We're going to have to board our baggage. And this is one thing that annoys me a little bit about GSX is that it locks everything else out and you can't do anything while it's fueling. Now, it might be a little bit troublesome to get to that aft baggage, but obviously the front baggage <laughs> um, is completely wide open while he's fueling. So why we are, you know, waiting 
it's it's a little frustrating. I, I get it a little bit because GSX has got to sort of work with all sorts of different aircraft. So you've got to have, you know, obviously this size fuel truck fueling, a, you know, an aerobody aircraft would pretty much block all of the cargo uh, areas from being fueled, from being uh, loaded properly. And I get that part. But uh, it just it's a little frustrating on the wide bodies because you can see there's so much space to work with. And even behind the fuel truck, if I go and do... Uh, my custom view. There's enough room in here for them to scoot, scoot to the, for them to squeeze in a loader and, and the baggage train in there as well, between the fuel truck and the uh, and the airplane itself. So, just a little frustrating. We got probably about five more minutes of fueling here. He's already at 46. Oh, not even about four, three or four more minutes of fueling. And we're going to get underway. One thing that's surprising me, making me a little bit happy, if, if not a little surprised, is that we actually do have um, some ATC online, not here in Montreal. But Boston Center is online at a crazy early hour in the morning. Uh, it's still dark outside. It's m so early in the morning, it's dark outside. Um, and then uh, Moncton, or not Moncton, uh, Gander uh, Oceanic is also online. So we're going to have some Gander Oceanic service today, which is also great. Um... Yeah, so uh, we're gonna have we're gonna deal with Gander. We're also gonna talk about Gander because uh, you know it's a little bit exciting. Cross the pond is coming up. It's about uh, just a little over two weeks away, uh, three weeks away, give or take. So uh, two and a half weeks away. It, it it's coming up pretty quick. It's gonna be a little different this year than previous years in a good way though, um, uh, because uh, especially North America is really suffering from the second wave, and I think Europe is doing the second the same thing. Uh, there is again an expectation that there is gonna be a lot of people flying across the pond this year, that it may break yet another record uh, like it did, or it's going to be certainly similar caliber in the spring. So there have been some steps taken to mitigate what's going on, but I'm going to talk more about that when we get into cruise. Uh, the reason why we're doing a night flight here, and I don't like doing a whole lot of night flying, um, is because I want to arrive in Nice in the daytime. So we started this flight super early because of the t time zone shifts as we had eastbound. It's going to be a really short day. Uh, I wanted to ar arrive in Nice before the sun sets or before certainly it's solidly night. The big reason behind that is that I want you to see the scenery there and I want you to see it in daytime. At night, these streams, they just they, they look awfully dark most of the time. So I was okay. I was willing to sacrifice a little bit of a dark departure. Oh, I heard the fuel stop. You guys hear the noise stop there? The fueling is done. He's going to start backing away in a second there. He's going to... Montreal traffic. Unplug. I can't believe there's somebody landing in Montreal, too. Colors. That is crazy. Must be someone long hauling. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, came from Boston. <laughs> what are the odds of that? I thought we were going to be alone this morning. I didn't think we were going to hear anything on the VATSIM network for a while, but apparently we are going to hear some... Traffic approaching. ILS, two apparently we're going to hear some stuff on the VATSIM network today. Alright, he's backing away, which means now they can come and load the cargo, which is great. Alright, guys, thank you. And then we'll be able to get underway here in about five minutes. I believe we're just about done loading the people. So in a second, we're going to be able to start the APU. I'm just going to watch these guys. Yeah. Oh, we're going to have to wait for the baggage trains, too. Which will not be nearby. You'd think they'd at least have them nearby. I really like GSX, but there's a few things about it that are just inefficient. And that can be frustrating. Alright, but we did get our full 51 tons. So they did get the revised fuel load, which is great. So we're going to go ahead and bring these guys out here, and I don't know where the baggage trains are, but they're going to be coming from somewhere similar to where the fuel truck came from, so it's going to take them three or four minutes to get here, so that's okay. We're not doing too badly, I just would like to be pushing back in the next couple minutes. Get this flight underway. If we're a little bit behind, well, so be it. we got a screaming tailwind today, uh, and that's one thing that's working to our advantage. As we get into the later time of year, the days get shorter, but the tailwinds start to really push up in the uh, at the polar front between the the uh, Arctic and the polar. Uh, or actually, we're probably between the continental or between the tropical and the uh, Arctic um, 
air masses. So we got a really strong jet stream across North America there. If I can pull it up, let's see here. Yeah, I can pull it up here. Uh, it's going to be down here on my maps. So if I skip ahead, there's our map for today. We're using that track Yankee. We're just avoiding some of this untowards turbulence right there. It's actually just perfect avoiding some of this turbulence areas. Um, but I can get to there's the winds you can see uh, we got a hundred plus knot winds. see the for those of you that have never seen this before I don't understand it it's um, the heavy triangle flags are 50 knot intervals the the single um, barbs are 10 knots and then a half barb is five knots so here you've got hundred and twenty knots and it's pretty much straight up our tail as we head out overseas now uh, the jet stream curves a little bit south here so we're gonna kind of get a little bit out of it as we uh, take our shortcut here but this is actually it doesn't look like it on the map but because of the curvature of the earth this is actually a shorter route if we were to fly through this because it's a little closer to the equator it's a little wider uh, it actually does take a little longer because of the the distance you're covering but yeah here's the jet stream takes a little curve to the south before it comes to the north so we'll pick up again some, some decent tailwinds here as we head south of Ireland south of Britain and onto mainland Europe before it starts to dissipate so uh, not too bad we're gonna get some decent uh, some decent winds today so that's going to help push us to Europe just that much faster. Are the baggage trains here yet? They are not. Uh, I think I see their shadows just coming along through the uh, through the corridor there. Uh, I can always try and use Chase Plane to spot them. If I go to... Uh, if I can go to gate... In here. Nope. Not there. That's us. And then I don't know why I can't see anything else. I can't get to any other gates. For some reason, there's no other. Anyway, they should be almost here. Here they come. Ah, and there's the lander there. There's the guy that was uh, calling on final. Who, who knew we were going to see other people here <laughs> today? I did not. Okay, they just got to load these bags. And then we can get underway. Yeah, it has been a long time since I streamed, so stuff has actually happened. We get to talk about it a little bit today. We are going to do the normal things with the long-haul streaming. I am going to spend some time online. I'm going to spend some time away because I just can't talk for the next uh, six and a half, seven hours to get us to uh, Europe. But... Uh, definitely we'll come back to deal with the ATC, not going to abandon the flight deck, not going to abandon the flight, but just uh, we'll have to step away just to give myself a little rest. But thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you guys for watching this channel as a whole. Um, this and this, these flights are kind of nice. They kind of end up being my little soapbox where I get to talk about pretty much whatever I want. Um, and I appreciate people listening to them. I, I, like I said, I, I, I feel like it's becoming a little bit stale, a little bit dated, so I may try and change some things up. Uh, one thing I was contemplating doing was maybe uh, putting out some highlight reels from these videos. Um, they do tend to be long, even when I cut, the, cut out all the away time or fast forward that. They do tend to be long videos, so I spend quite a bit of time talking about various topics that I think are of interest to simmers. I'm, I would like to think about finding the, the best things I've said in each stream and trying to get them out there. Uh, so, uh, what am I trying to say here? Um, you know, like, I do like commentary on various topics, and if I think that the commentary is particularly relevant, particularly useful, I may do that. Or, uh, then I also provide just, like, helpful tips about the aviation industry as a whole and how to make your flying more realistic. So, again, if I can find ways um, to make that... Uh, you know, to, to extract those clips in particular and use them as separate videos. I may try to do that. So what we could do is do that and then say cockpit to ground. Go ahead. Please disconnect external power. Roger, disconnecting the GPU. So that's good to go and we're also just going to get ready to prepare for pushback and departure. So as soon as we're done boarding the tug's going to pull up and be ready to go as well. Oh, but if I do that, he closes all the exits. 
Oh, stupid. Then they're loading through closed exits. I can try to open them, but it seems like it rechecks like multiple times. Captain, the GPU is now disconnected. I wonder if it's the GPU. I wonder if it's disconnecting the GPU that triggers, because I think it's FS2 crew that closes the doors in this case. I don't think it's GSX that closes the doors. I think it's FS2 crew. And FS2 crew keeps on closing them. It keeps on checking. And keeps on closing them. Frustrating as that is to watch them load through closed doors now. So we got about four bins to go here. So yeah, we'll be pushing back from the gate in the next 10 minutes at the most. I really wish they would do that at the same time. It really is just frustrating. Not that one, that one. Um, but if I go back to my loading screen, you'll see we are pretty much... Yeah, he's got 1.8 out of 3 tons. For some reason, we ended up with only 295 passengers instead of 296. Isn't that interesting? I hope it's going to trigger that it is fully loaded. Properly. It's weird. I think Hi, it Captain. will, though. The passenger boarding is complete, and I've got the load sheet here for you when you're ready. Thank you. Have a safe flight. All right. We are just about ready to go here. I'm going to just fast forward this about four more minutes there. Maybe one more minute. And then I anticipate that the loading will be done at about the same time. And we got everything pretty much ready to go in the flight deck, ready to go outside. We are just waiting on that baggage. And that's the thing about the airline industry, you're always waiting for something. I just read an article, uh, not an article, actually, it was a thread of people complaining about uh, one airline in particular that they don't like, that they think has lousy service. And while I sometimes tend to agree, people who are in the industry will always acknowledge this, and I think will always give people a lot of leeway um, that... When you work at a, when you're an airline, there is so much that has to happen prior to departure, and everything has to happen at the right time for the departure to happen on time. You've got to have all the equipment. You've got to have the pushback tug actually show up. Um, you've got to have obviously a ramp crew schedule. They've got to be there on time. They've got another airplane to be at right after you depart. Everything's scheduled very tightly in airlines. So if 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 you're late for any reason, then the next flight's going to be late. Or if the flight before you was late, then you might be late. Um, you know, they might have to find another ramp crew, and they may not have one. Go ahead. All right, Captain, we're removing the jetway now. Thank you. Uh, you know, fuel truck's got to show up, catering's got to show up, kid agent's got to load the plane on time, there's got to be no issues with the loading. Um, so much has got to happen for a flight to, to, to leave on time. Paperwork's got to be done. So many different people touch each flight. Uh, and if any one of them falls behind for whatever reason because they have something unusual going on with another flight, it can set a whole chain of flights back. So sometimes it, you look at how many moving pieces there are in an airline, and it's a miracle that anybody leaves on time. Now, that being said, um, I think the, the complaint that I was reading had more, I think, to do with uh, the, the way the staff of the airline treat their customers. And that is something that, uh, regardless of whether you're on time or not, you have to treat people with respect. You have to treat them, uh, treat them nicely. Some airlines, especially legacy carriers, and I don't want to generalize completely, but... All right, guys. Everyone seated. We're all buttoned up and ready to go in the back. Thank you. If you need anything, just let me know. But I do find that legacy carriers do have more of a reputation, and some of them have tried to have hard, tried hard to overcome it. But uh, you often end up with a lot of staff that's worked for the company for a very long time, and they feel like they, you know, s some of them almost make it feel like they are doing you a favor by carrying you in their airplanes rather than... Uh, rather than you are doing them a favor by giving them and their company revenue, and especially in this day and age, uh, revenue is is crucial because airlines are just not getting it. Most airlines have seen drops of easily 80, 90, 95% in their revenue, if not 100% for those that have just shut down altogether for the time, if temporarily, if not permanently. And yet you still get people who, who you know, who who 
I, I just don't, I just don't understand it because it's not my philosophy. Certainly, when I deal with 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 customers and passengers, I do my best to to provide good service to each and every person that I encounter along the way. It doesn't always work out, but I do my best, and I try to always start every day with a smile and keep that smile on my face as long as I can, as long as uh, you know, try to try to treat each person individually, and even if the previous people have left me in a bad mood, try to just move on from it. But you just feel with legacy carries, you, and it's not everybody, but there's a there's a large enough percentage of people at some of these legacy carries that have been there for so long and are just feel like they've been uh, beaten down, I guess. I don't know. Or they take it out on their passengers, on their customers, and it, 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 just, there's just no need for it. There really is no need. We can, we can, we could do better. We should do better. Uh, as an industry as a whole, because some of these younger airlines, especially people, are always smiling, they're always happy, and they're happy to have their jobs, and maybe they don't remember the better times it used to be, but rather than dwell in the past, live in the present, live in the now, don't dwell in the past, look to the future, what can we do to keep this airline going and make sure that you still have a job and, and, and are making a reasonable, a reasonable salary, instead of looking back at, well, I used to make more, so because I'm unhappy because I make less than I used to, you know, I took cuts in the last recession or whatever, it, and anyways, it it frustrates me because I love this business, but sometimes I hate this business, and and I hate the way we treat people in this business. Come on, uh, any second now, that tug's gonna move into place, and we're gonna be good to go here. I could do the check night now because the doors are all closed. Where's that door button? I can't. I see it. There it is. Yeah, they're all closed. Before start checklist down to the line. Before start checklist down to the line. Cockpit prep. Complete. Completed. Gears, pins, and covers. Removed. Signs. On. ADIRS. Nav. Fuel quantity. 51 tons. Takeoff data. Set. Barrow ref. 3021 set. 3021 cross checked. Set. Okay, before start checklist completed to the line. Before start procedures. Okay. Well, Hello, Captain. While You're he's doing that, back. I just have one thing I really quickly have to do. Because I realized I never did it. Before start checklist below the line. Before start checklist below the line. Windows and doors. Closed. Closed. Beacon. On. Thrust levers. Idle. Parking brake. Released. Before start checklist complete. Departure check completed. No, I guess I was one second too soon for that. Release parking brakes. And there we go. Commencing push. All engines clear. Start and we're starting. We're pushing back. And what I was doing here really quickly was I was just starting up my Sim Toolkit Pro, which seems to have a new version, so again it seems to have forgotten me. So we're just gonna start the engine. Start engine one. Start engine two. I think it's start engine two in the bus. Different aircraft start different engines first. There's been a recent set of updates to Sim Toolkit Pro, and the automatic login is turned off. So now I got it turned back on, and I'm just going to start up my flight again here. Oh, and what did I do? What do I always do? I always forget to turn on that stupid APU bleed in this airplane. It's not on any of the checklist. It's not automa automatic. There we go. Now we're getting some uh, rotation there. We should have the engine instruments up down there as well. There we go. Nope, that's not it. APU. There we go. Darn small buttons in this airplane. Me and my big fat mouse. <laughs> All right, so the pushback is well underway. We do have light off. 
N2 is up, the oil pressure is up. There we go, it looks like we got uh, a normal start on two, starting engine one. Set parking brakes. N2 rotation. Waiting your confirmation for good engine start. We do have oil pressure running. This is one thing that annoys me is that I, th I feel like these engines start too fast in the Airbus. There's fuel flow, light off. It seems okay until the light off, and then it seems like the light off. It really accelerates really quickly after the light off. Not so bad in the 330, but the 320 especially, it's almost instantaneous after the light off. It's very... I feel like that's not probably very realistic. I feel like it's a little abbreviated. And after flying the A320 in Microsoft Flight Simulator, not that that should be necessarily the benchmark I hold anybody to, but it, that one starts a little slower. But I imagine that they're... With all the efforts that the Sobo has put in, confirm good engine start. Cockpit to ground. Go ahead. You're clear to disconnect and go to hand signals. All right, you're off safe flight. All right, so he's going to disconnect and everything. Um, yeah, so it feels like it starts a little slower in Microsoft Flight Simulator. That's one thing that P3D and, and FSX never really had, was they didn't have a good built-in model of turbine engines at all. All their kind of modeling of engine dynamics and performance here. was based on a piston engine and the way a piston engine works. So all of this stuff was sort of done external to the sim and tried to mesh into the sim, but I think a Sobo has some built-in turbine engine characteristics anyways. I'm not going to say it's perfect. I'm sure it's not perfect. But it just seems like the start cycle is a bit of a norm more normal length on the Asobo 320. I've never actually flown any Airbus product, so I can't say for sure. But it just feels like it just happens too fast. I've seen my I've seen my share of turbine engines starting. There he goes. Where's my marshaller? Hard to see, guys, because it's just such a big, bloody airplane. <laughs> We're so far off the ground. He's going to walk away at any second now. I don't think he's going to be on this side. I think he's going to be on this side. Uh, oh, there he is. There he is. I see him. After start procedures. Check. Flaps 1 plus F. Check. Left is clear. Right is clear. Thanks, buddy. We'll see you next time. After start checklist. Okay, after start checklist. Anti ice. Off. Ecam status. Checked. Pitch trim. For upset. Rudder trim. Zero. After start checklist complete. Flight control check. Ready. Uh, full up. Full down. Neutral. Full left. Full right. Neutral. Full left. Full right. Neutral. Clear on the left. Clear on the right. Montreal traffic. Good morning. Transat 648 at uh, gate 57. We're commencing taxi for departure runway 24 left will be Alpha 4 Alpha crossing runway 28. Haven't handled a big beast in a while. I have not been flying P3D very much at all. Microsoft Flight Simulator really has taken a lot of my time. I found a, a new love for FS economy now with the uh, airplanes available. It's a pity there's no good airliners in um, Microsoft Flight Simulator. It does have those default airliners. They're pretty rudimentary to say the least right off the bat. So it's a pity because I would like to take advantage of them. The scenery is so nice in Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's not perfect. It, I'll never say it's perfect. Um, 
French VACC wants to know what my ETA is. Okay, uh, good question. Um, we are going to be... Uh, we're just about to get airborne here. It's going to be about 6.30 in total. So uh, we're going to get airborne here. Uh, let's see. So six and a half hours from now. Flight deck. Uh, what is okay. it now? It's <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's ten. We're going at ten thirty Zulu. So we're going to be landing in Nice at around seventeen hundred Zulu today. That's the expectation. So if you guys are online, that would be fantastic. I appreciate that. I'm always grateful for any ATC we do get. Uh, I am trying to time this flight as well. The other great thing about arriving in the afternoon is I do get to take advantage of the European ATC in the evening as we arrive. So he said the flight, uh, the cabin is secure, which is great. So, uh, yeah, if you guys are online, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much if you can do that. I am shocked that I have ATC at this end. You know, it is six. It's 6.30 in the morning at this end right now. Uh, so... I was not expecting to have any ATC online for the first hour or two, and it looks like we're going to be talking to Boston in about 30 minutes or so here once we get airborne and turned eastbound. Assuming they haven't logged off. They might have logged off by now, but you never know. Oh, they did. <laughs> never mind. All that ATC that I was talking about is gone. There was a there was a Boston, there was a Gander, and they're gone. So, oh well. Maybe we'll get someone else. All right, so then we're now on Alpha 4, Alpha. This is one of my pet peeves right here at this airport. And this is Skylucky75, thank you. I appreciate that. If not, I appreciate the effort, even if nothing happens. But uh, I always uh, I always love to have ATC on a live stream. Um, something I've been thinking about doing. And uh, you guys can go ahead and tell me if you think this is worthwhile. But uh, I know that uh, FS Economy in combination with Microsoft Flight Simulator has become really popular. I was thinking about putting a, together a quick little quick start guide for Microsoft Flight Simulator and VATSIM. Because everyone knows I love VATSIM. Love flying it on, on the online network here. All right, clear on the right and clear on the left. I just have to turn this off. Clear on the left. Clear on the right. We're going to say clear to cross runway 28. Nobody should be landing on it anyways. It's been closed for years now, essentially. Uh, yeah, so I was thinking of putting together a video about VATSIM uh, at Microsoft Flight Simulator, like a quick start kind of video to get uh, people with the new Microsoft Flight Sim started on VATSIM. Because definitely guys are seem to be very interested in FS Economy. I have not seen this much interest in FS Economy in a long time, and I'm enjoying it too. I really am, because... Frankly, you're uh, like I'm exploring tons of airports. I'm exploring the scenery that uh, that uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator has to offer, thanks to FS Economy. And uh, so, there's a huge renaissance in FS Economy happening, and I'd like to try and maybe funnel some of these people that have seen my videos into Fatsim. And then it, it's I'm I know that there's been videos done, tutorials done, but by having one out in my channel too. Uh, I think, you know, like, really, like, and I'm, and I'm thinking of keeping it very basic at this point. It's very much just a, you know, literally, here is the software you need, here's how the system works, here's how you sign up, and here are the most basic rules of the road. Don't spawn on the runway. That's, that's like, rule number one, I think, for newbies on <laughs> on VATSIM. Don't connect when you're on the runway. Connect almost anywhere else. Connect on a on the ramp somewhere. Connect when you're airborne, but just don't connect on a runway. <laughs> Really try to keep it to less than 10 minutes, the most basic stuff to get people going, but uh, there's so much potential for people to join the VATSIM network with uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator now being so popular. Hard to believe my coffee is already cold. <laughs> Alright, we're getting there. Long taxi out in Montreal, and I have had some long taxis out here. I remember one day we were out here in the middle of winter, de-iced, 45 minute hold over time in the de-icing bay, got out here and because it was only this runway for arrivals and no other runways, there, and they weren't spacing them out enough, nobody departed. There was a lineup of 20 something airplanes here on this taxiway and we all just sat here and we all just one at a time watched as our hold over times expired and we all taxied back to the gate to get more fuel. And, let's see, we spent five hours trying to leave that day, and we never ended up leaving because of one thing after another, but Montreal ATC was one of the worst factors. Their inability to space the arrivals to the point where we could have even a couple of departures. We had no chance to ever get out.
And this is the this is the one double edged sword of, of, of getting people into the network with Microsoft Flight Simulator is that we're gonna get people who don't understand ATC at all. Um, that don't realize like this is not like, like when we when we deal with VATSIM we're dealing with a high end simulation. You'll have to pardon me while I do my important things here. Before start check before takeoff checklist down to the line. Before takeoff checklist down to the line. Flight controls. Checked. Checked. Flight instruments. Checked. Checked. Briefing. Confirmed. Uh, flap setting. Config 1 plus F. Config 1 plus F. V1, VR, V2, flex temp. V1, 135, VR, 135, V2, 143, flex temp is 41 degrees. Flex temp is 41 degrees. V1 is 1, 3, 5. V rotate is 1, 3, 5. V2 is 1, 4, 3. And for the flex temp. Montreal traffic transit 648 is taking position. Runway degrees. 24 left for departure, ATC. left turn out. Set. ECAM memo. Takeoff no blue. Before takeoff checklist complete to the line. Cabin crew seats for departure. Clear on the approach. Clear on the left. Fort. Before takeoff checklist below the line. Before takeoff checklist below the line. Cabin crew. Advised. TCAS. T A R A. Engine mode selector. Norm. PAX. On. Okay, before takeoff checklist is complete. Before we get airborne, just going to check and make sure that this is tracking. It is. It says end flight there. That's good. All right, away we go. Take off. Check. Thrust set. Checked. One hundred knots. Checked. Rotate. Positive rate. Gear up. Gear up. Autopilot on. Autopilot two on. Check. Flaps up. Flap zero. Speed two thirty. After takeoff checklist down to the line. After takeoff checklist down the line. Landing gear. Up. Flaps. Retracted. Packs. 
On. After takeoff checklist completed to the line. Just wait for that 3,000 mark. And here it comes. Direct and take. We're actually making it a right turn. Oh, because we're doing the right turn out. Yeah. We're doing the uh, slightly more northern departure. I was thinking we were going due east, but we're doing the northeast departure, so that makes sense. Alright, we can put it... Uh, we're going to just let the speed... We're going to let the uh, airplane make its turn mil. here. Set flight level 350. Let him set 350. While I just look out the window. Whee! And I'm just going to wait till we make it about halfway here. So we basically got it like right at green dot, like kind of the minimum uh, speed here that we normally would want to maintain in flight around the turn because there's no point flying Level opposite the direction three, we're trying to go. Five, zero. Once we get two thirds of the way around the turn here, we can go ahead and engage manage speed and let it start to accelerate some more. But when you depart, Especially if you have to make a turn that's more than 90 degrees from your runway heading to get on course, there's no point in going fast until you're established on course. The slower you go, the sharper the turns will be, and the sooner they'll happen. So there we go. So now we'll put it to managed speed. It'll dunk down to 250 knots, but the turn was just a little bit sharper and got us on course 30 seconds to a minute sooner. It's not much, but in the airlines, it adds up quickly. Every little bit you can do to save fuel adds up quickly. So there we go. We're pretty much turning right back overhead the field. There's the airport right down there again. Mind you, we're at 6,600 feet, so at least we're overhead everything. We would be interfering with any arrivals that were coming in if it was a daytime kind of scenario. But this time of night, there ain't much happening, so I'm not too worried. And yes, we were heavy. Uh, let's see here. We we're, at, we're at 155 tons ZFW plus 50 tons of fuel, so we were at 200 tons for takeoff here. Uh, she's a heavy bus. And it's not that Nice is by any means the limit. We could definitely go quite a bit further, but uh, certainly with a full bus, it's a long way to go. All right, but there we go. We're underway. Another 1,500 till we kill the sterile flight deck. there. There's the 10,000. He's got the lights. Good. Okay, it looks like a nice night out there, so we can go ahead and kill the seatbelts as well. And that's it. We're underway. I'm sure it's super dark out there for anybody watching the video. Don't I have a logo light on? Is the logo light not modeled in this? That's crazy. There's no logo light on the tail. Wow. For all well, the time they spend on this airplane, you would think the logo light would work. Huh. That kind of throws me. This kind of surprises me a little bit. Alright, now we're accelerating. Even though we've got a good wind behind us, we're going to go pretty fast on this because we've got a hot cost index of 100. We're trying to get to Europe as quick as reasonably possible to keep the stream to a reasonable length. But yeah, I, the, the thing that has surprised me lately, and I'll have to go and check the analytics to be sure, but uh, certainly with regards to my YouTube channel, is how popular my FS Economy videos became very quickly. Um, I was just absolutely shocked at that. Uh, they were quite, they were fairly popular in right off the bat when I first published them, and then at some point, somebody posted a link somewhere on Reddit, in a forum, I don't know where, but uh, all of a sudden there was one particular day about two weeks after my two or three weeks after my first FS Economy video was posted. And my gosh, the uh, the hits went crazy after that. Uh, definitely not like viral level, but I mean for compared to anything I've done previously and possibly even compared to, I, I put together the, um, I put together the audio for VATSIM 
some of the audio for VATSIM uh, initial testing videos. Uh, when we did the original test, like a year before release in Toronto, I published those videos, um, and I published one of the one of uh, what was supposed to be the last AFV test, uh, like a month before it was launched. And I thought those videos were popular when they first posted those. And uh, these FS Economy videos may have left them in the dust. I, I'm, I'm shocked at every day still how many people are watching these FS Economy videos, which just. Uh, and I think, again, it's a combination of Microsoft Flight Simulator it has really brought a ton of new blood to the platform, um, and just the fact that it is uh, such a good such a good topic, uh, such a good use for Microsoft Flight Simulator, more so than the airline flying. So those videos have really kind of uh, kind of taken off, uh, taken a life of their own. In fact, uh, you know, they became my most watched videos of the year in under 30 days, I think about 20 something days, they they overtook all the videos that have been around for the whole rest of the year, uh, videos that were published years ago, and were still quite popular on my channel, all my systems videos, and they overtook those and became, in less than a month, became the most popular videos on my channel. So, it, sometimes it's just weird, like, it, I had not expected that. When I did this, when I did my first tutorial to FS Economy, I really didn't do that with an eye to the number of views I was going to get. I just thought I was, you know, going to do something to help contribute to the com community, help point out some things. Wow, it is really dark out there. There's not much to see. It's going to be daylight in another half an hour, hopefully, but <sighs> there really is not much to see on this stream when it's nighttime. Uh, all the excitement is in the flight deck. There's not much excitement outside the flight deck. This is why I don't like streaming at night. It, it's just, it's so dark, and then the, uh, the codec that's used for Twitch streaming especially does not help dark environments. Uh, it really doesn't. I could turn up, I can try and turn up like the gamma or something and it might make it a little bit easier to see stuff that's happening outside. I think if you look in the distance you can just sort of see the, the dawn starting. But yeah, there really is not much going on out here, unfortunately. A little bit of a cloud layer too, so there really is literally almost nothing. Just trying to get a hint of light there near the horizon, but I don't think you guys can even see how that's what that looks like, because it just Twitch streaming is dark. I find the the, the, the codec for Twitch does not pick up on uh, like on uh, you know low contrast dark colors, which I find that funny because a lot of games take place in a very dark. Oh, there is transition. I'm waiting for that. After takeoff checklist, below the line. After takeoff checklist, below the line. Barrel ref. Standard set. Standard set. After takeoff checklist is complete. Yeah, so that's one trouble with with. Um, with Twitch, yeah, but I, 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 yeah, I do find that surprising because it, you know, there's a lot of games that take place in you know very dark, like sinister, haunting environments. Darkness is often a big part of a lot of games, so to have a codec that doesn't really paint the darkness well is kind of surprising. So I'm just gonna see if I can mess with this a little bit here. Uh, I've messed with it before. So there is, there we go. So I've turned the gamma way up, and it doesn't look great, because it really kind of, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this really well, but what I'm seeing here on my stream output is I'm seeing like very sharp, defined gradients, uh, which is not the case on the actual SIM screen. On the actual SIM screen, uh, it's very, it's a very smooth transition, but just because the the codec, and maybe it's just to, to keep the codec reasonable, but it's got a relatively limited color palette, I think. But you definitely are seeing a little bit more there, and, and in another half an hour, like I said, the sun will come up, and then it'll have a nice daytime flight. Yeah, Nice Airport is empty. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, I've, I've always found that Nice is one that's fairly quiet most of the time, unless I think, unless there's an event going on, I've never seen a whole lot of traffic out of Nice, a little bit. Uh, Barcelona, I do see a fair bit. I, I've gone in and out of Barcelona on the same coastline there a few times. I see a bit of traffic there, but Nice is one that's it's a little bit quiet. It's a shame because it's a beautiful airport. I can't wait to uh, show this off in the sim, and that's why I really want to arrive during daylight because it's beautiful, beautiful countryside. And then uh, it's funny because uh, in Microsoft Flight Simulator again, 
uh, one of the landing challenges takes place at Nice, and my gosh, if that isn't uh, a really beautiful approach in the new sim, the, deep, the, the scenery, everything in the new sim looks really good. I cannot wait to get some of these airplanes into that new simulator. Uh, I'm beginning to wonder what's going to be first. Uh, the one thing that came along this week that, uh, I won't say it came out of nowhere, but uh, the one thing that came along this week and it gives me a little bit of hope is Quality Wings uh, came along and pointed out, uh, posted some screenshots of their 787 in Microsoft Flight Simulator. So Quality Wings is bringing their 787 to Microsoft Flight Simulator. They said uh, in their post that they're targeting first quarter of next year, which is actually not too bad. That's, you know, six to nine months ahead of PMDG. Now, mind you, it's definitely not a PMDG level product, uh, but it's still a good level product. It's definitely up there with the level where I would, would want to be using that in the sim. And I think that the one of the, I think you're going to see that the first airliner, especially that makes it into new sim, is going to have a very uh, big following because people are just yearning to get their hands on some of this good long haul stuff. The small stuff is not bad. Runway 22. I'm just trying to envision Nice. I don't even know where Runway 20. I, I've only been, I've only flown into Nice a couple of times, so I'm really not familiar with it. But I can pull this up any time. Hold on, that's that's why I'm searching in the wrong place. <laughs> Funny. That's why. I really do use know how to use my EFB, I promise. <laughs> okay. There's Nice Cote d'Azur. Uh let's see here. Airport briefing. SIDS, lots of SIDS. Must be Europe. Three thousand SIDS. I thought Toronto had a lot of SIDS. Uh, swing around for 22. Yeah, so I think we're set up for fours right now. If the winds swing around for 22, that would be really great because you get, you kind of come out overseas, as I recall, but overseas, over the over the, uh, over the the Mediterranean anyways, and then swing in so you'll have a great view in front of us at the airport. So either way, it's going to be a beautiful arrival. The key is to, to get there as quickly as possible and try and get there before it's the sun sets. <laughs> Even now, as we're going here, this, it's definitely starting to get a little bit brighter out there. So we're starting to head towards the sun. Hopefully we'll pick up some sunshine soon. And it'll get a little better because, yeah, I just, I don't like streaming at night anymore because I realized how dark these videos are. Unless there's a lot of detail going on. Um, if you're, you're, you know, you're flying into a very busy city with a lot of lights, but especially long haul streaming at night, it's just a couple of flight deck lights and, and otherwise it's pretty dark so unless you crank up the gamma which I've got it cranked up it gives it an unnatural kind of glow right now but that's what I had to do to get anything visible outside but that's why I'm, I'd much rather see the approach during the daytime so even if it's just sort of the sun's going down at the point where we get there let's just have a look now see this is going to be totally inaccurate because I don't have any winds in there it says 1754 don't bet on that because we're going to have about 100 knots behind us most of the way easily 50 to 100 knots behind us for a good portion of this trip. Let's see, we've already got, no way, we've already got 111 knots behind us just through 27,000 feet here. Holy jeez. Grounding 572. Yeah, so the MCDU says 1754. There's no winds in that MCDU yet. So I would expect us to be a little bit earlier than that. I'm going to probably put in some winds here in a minute. It's tedious. I love PMDG, the fact that you can import the winds and get them via A cars because, oh, getting the winds on this can be, getting enough winds in here to be, uh, give it a really reasonable, and I'm a little bit worried now, a little tiny bit worried, because last time, it was while I was putting in the winds that the FMS crashed, and the sim crashed, and, oh, yeah, oh, I, I really... I want to put in the winds. I really do. And Aerosoft, I love your Airbus, your A320 products, but for some reason your 330 and I just don't tend to get along. We really just don't. I 
don't know why. Something with my computer, because I know other people who said they operated flawlessly. I know you guys have said you take it with clean installs of Windows and operate it flawlessly, and I've tried to take it with clean installs of Windows, and it just doesn't want to operate properly, so... I fear that there may be some little hardware glitch somewhere in my computer that I built, and I don't know where it is, I don't know what it is, if it's the motherboard, if it's uh, the memory... But, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's very frustrating because this is a nice airplane, and I like flying it. I like flying it from, a, from, a, from an airplane perspective, but it always makes me a little nervous operating it because I'm always worried that something I'm going to do is going to cause it to crash. Like I said, last time it was, it was me putting in the winds. I was putting in the winds, and I think I found I missed a waypoint. I had tried to add the extra waypoint, and the sim crashed. And especially after you put all the effort into it, you know, you put an hour of effort into getting the airplane up in the air, especially live streaming. Nothing worse than crashing during a live stream. <laughs> okay. Ah, there's so much wind here, though, that i got to put some stuff in here, I think. So Let's see if we can at least put a few winds in here. Starting at Sifu where our top of the climb will be, 254 at 120. I'm going to try not to put too many winds in here, but enough to sort of get it representative. So, two fifty four at one twenty at three five oh. And then let's see here. 252 at 126, 253 at 141. By Rickle, it's a little bit higher. Oh, don't crash on me now. Okay. Oh. Every little pause in the sim now gets me panicky. What'd I say? Uh, I'm playing chicken with my simulator here at this point. really afraid that at some point I'm going to put in just a little bit too much information and it's going to crash. And there's a lot of waypoints on this flight. So we'll go with 5340, we'll put 271 at 115. try to do no more than every other point. And maybe even less than that if I can get away with it. Uh, unfortunately, the wind really kind of falls off here. 288 to 85. 279 at 53. Okay, we'll do these couple, and then we'll probably be able to skip a couple. 288 at 85 at 85 and then at 5320 279 and 53 there we go 279 and 53 all right and then that stays fairly consistent 41 I'm still okay with that that's within 10 knots and that goes back up see it's fairly consistent from there uh, as we get to Aluta, it goes up to 243 at 84, so let's go to Aluta. So that by that point we're heading back south, and we're going to fly back into the jet stream a little bit. It's 84. That one. 253 at 84. 243 at 84. I'm well, not close enough anyways. It'll make a pretty reasonable calculation. B red 250 at 74. Let's skip till here. Usoda 264 at 66. Oh. Come on, track higher. You can do it. Thousand to go. Check. There we go. Okay. Hopefully, I think that should be enough wins make this uh, wind calculation pretty reasonable and realistic here. It's going to keep falling off there. 40s to 50s, 30s eventually. 
I think that's enough. I don't want to put in too many because I just... Eh, and still, okay. Uh, 1656. Wow. That chopped some time off. I don't know if that's going to necessarily stick as a time, but... Because I, I, I didn't do it totally accurately. I skipped a few wins here and there. The winds are getting lighter at the farther end, lighter than what I have in there. There's Alt Cruise Star. And... There is... Da da da! Come on! <laughs> Alt Cruise, there it is. I hate this tray. I really do. I don't know if I would ever really pull it out in real life. I mean, it's weird because I've, I'll, I'll say I've never flown the Airbus, so I've never had like the I never had an airplane without a control column in front of me. So it would be weird to have an airplane without a control column right in front of you, and maybe I'd need that there just to take up space. I don't know. It feels weird to have a tray right in front of you. I mean, it's nice when you want to eat. Don't get me wrong. Ask any airline pilot, and they will tell you what it's like to sit there trying to eat a meal while balancing it on the clipboard that they pulled out and or, lay, or the journey log that they pulled out and laid across their lap as some sort of a sort of pseudo table. Every airline pilot in the world out there has tried to eat off the, the back of the journey log. <laughs> okay. Well, we made it up to cruise. We're not doing too bad here. Made it up to cruise. I haven't even put anything on here. Let's put some VORs and DMEs just to get some sense of place here. out here. We've already passed Quebec and we're on our way to Sifu. Nicely done. Alright, that's not what I meant to do. I meant to zoom that out a little more. So we're on our way to Sifu. Kind of over the eastern shore of Quebec. I don't think we would have actually flown into Boston Center's airspace on this one today. Um, I can check. Because I do have my Sim Toolkit Pro up here. A live map is always a bit of a killer in terms of performance. Uh, yeah, see, this flight takes us just north of Maine, so this would have actually not gone through Boston's airspace anyway, so we would not have talked to Boston anyways, regardless. Uh, Gander, of course, we would have talked to, but we're not going to because they're offline again. Which is a bit of a shame, but what can you do? Turn flight, alright. Now, I notice this icon's changed here. Now, I wonder, this little, little circle here, is that indicating, that's indicating, like, what percentage... And I see six there. So I wonder, is that the percentage of completion of this flight? Because that might be a new feature. That's kind of neat. I like that. That's that's neat. Uh, I will say, Sim Toolkit Pro does do a great job of continually updating their, prod their product right now. You know, and... and that's, that's one thing that I do appreciate is people who put a lot of effort into it. This is a labor of love for the guy who runs this, too. It's not... Uh, He's not doing it for profit. He'll take donations if you're willing to give them, but he's just doing it just as a labor of love to give back to the community something he wanted that you know he's put out there for other people to have as well, which is uh, really, uh, which is really great. And you know what? And and I find that I find mo I don't have a problem with with uh, donating money to these people that do um, that that do put out good products. And the fact that they put it out there for free and you can try it and determine if it's useful to you. You know, back at the day, I used to be a cheap bastard. <laughs> I won't hesitate to say it. When I was younger, I didn't have a whole lot of disposable income. I was a cheap bastard. I would take any free products I could get my hands on. and Oh, you're a sucker. You're going to give it away for free. But it's a, it's a philosophy that works for a lot of people, I think. Because uh, I have found plenty of free products over the years. Simbrief's another example of one. Um, I have used it endlessly, and I have no problem donating money uh, every year to Simbrief to keep it running because I know it's not cheap to, to you know, to to run the kind of calculations that he's running on that uh, server, and the fact that he's put it all together in such a realistic package. I'm just looking at the sunrise here now, and I'm just wondering if this is if I can get rid of the filter on this. So let's just check and see what it looks like. There you go. I'm gonna get rid of that uh, correction there, that uh, gamma filter correction, because we're starting to see some 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 detail out there now. The sun's starting to come up. You can see a little better. It's not just pitch black anymore, which is great. Um, yeah, so actually that's something that I did want to talk about too with you guys, uh, you know, through the Twitch stream here. Um, so those of you that may... So first of all, um, to back it up a step, those of you that did not see the video in my YouTube channel, and if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube uh, channel, please please do. Uh, I think I post lots of interesting uh, aviation-related videos on there. It's uh, youtube.com slash captainnaps, C-A-P-T 
N-A-B-S, same as the uh, Twitch stream channel here. Um, so for the, those of you that uh, haven't uh, found it already, uh, this last week, just last weekend, I reached a uh, milestone that uh, I honestly never thought I was going to reach when I started the channel, and that is I've got my first thousand subscribers. And it's not a whole lot. A thousand is not a lot in the grand scheme of the YouTube world. I realize that. There's people with hundreds of thousands uh, of subscribers out there. So, you know, a thousand is really, at the end of the day, is not that much. But for me, it was it was just so gratifying. I had I put a lot of myself into this channel, a lot of time, a lot of effort, and just to know that people are out there, are enjoying it, and making use of it, I think is the, is the biggest thing to me. I I appreciate that. You know, there's a, tons of stuff out there on YouTube to watch. There's literally millions and possibly billions of hours of YouTube videos out there to watch, and the fact that people are picking my channel and choosing to subscribe to it. Yeah, it's gratifying, even if it's only a small number of people. I'm glad that some people are getting some some joy and benefit out of it. So I was very happy. I knew it was coming because, you know, I'm obviously watching and I see how many people subscribe, but I was still, nonetheless, it's a great landmark, and it pr happened pretty much almost three years to the day after I started the channel. Uh, give or take about a week. It took me three years to get to my first thousand subscribers. So thank you to everybody who subscribed. And for those of you that aren't aware, that haven't seen it, I did have a contest. I, I actually had a contest. It's over now. But I had a contest. I gave away three great prizes um, to my subscribers. Just as a thank you to my subscribers, I managed to get three prizes. And I, I was, frankly, I wasn't sure I would get some great prizes, but I, I, I tried, you know, and, and I did. I was able to secure you guys uh, um, a copy of A Pilot's Life here, uh, a copy of Pushback Express for Flight Simulator, and a copy of the Majestic Dash 8, uh, which I was just... Uh, again, also thank you to those developers that supported my ch that supported my channel in that respect and were willing to donate a prize. Uh, you know, um, I think I've done a lot for the developers as well in my channel because uh, those were three things. I picked those things specifically because I had I was focused. Uh, I focused a lot on those products. I focused a lot on uh, a pilot's life here, obviously with four seasons, probably about uh, 50 episodes here of streaming a pilot's life. Uh, so, and I think, and I'm pretty sure I've convinced a lot of people to buy a pilot's life through showing that over the years. Um, obviously, FS2 crew products I'm a big fan of as well, so uh, nice to have a new product there, one for the new sim that I think a lot of people will not have, and it's a great prize to give away. Um, the Majestic Dash as well, I mean, that is a very valuable prize, even now in this era. A lot of people are still flying the P3D and FSX platform. Um, it was very generous of them to give me a prize, for give me that... Uh, donate that prize as well. I've done a lot, I think, for Majestic as well in terms of just being a, putting out a lot of Dash 8 videos which got people interested in their Dash 8. So I wouldn't be surprised if at least a couple people have bought the Dash 8 because of me. Um, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn, I'm just trying to say that there was a give and take there. And, uh, you know, I've, I've definitely promoted these products and uh, it was very nice and generous of these developers to donate uh, to my contest. So uh, I'm going to have a uh, final contest video with uh, just a thanking everyone and naming the uh, the people who have won the prizes once I've confirmed everybody has uh, has gotten their prize. Um, but yeah, so so I, I, I managed to pass that 1,000 subscriber mark. So one thing that some of you probably have noticed on my YouTube channel as a result now is that I have enabled uh, monetization. I have enabled ads on my channel. And I'm sure some of you are probably not happy about it. Uh, you know, one little one more channel with advertising. It's so ubiquitous on YouTube, first of all, that I don't think too many people are probably going to honestly notice it. Probably most of you probably wouldn't have even noticed it if I hadn't said something. Because it's just so ubiquitous. You just start an ad, you start a video on YouTube and there's almost always an ad at the start of it. It's just the way YouTube is. Any but, you know, everybody tries to monetize it. And I have fallen for that as well. But, um, first of all, I'm not going to make a whole lot of money off of my YouTube channel. Not unless I suddenly magically get 10,000 subscribers, 100,000 subscribers overnight. I'm not going to make a whole lot of money off of the YouTube channel. And that's not really the goal. Um, the only goal of monetizing my YouTube channel and showing ads on my YouTube channel is that I'm going to be trying to offset a little bit the cost of this hobby. Uh, anyone who's a serious flight simmer knows that this can be a very expensive hobby, that there is no end to the amount of add-ons that you can you can add and the new sim is no exception the number of airports that have already been published for the new sim uh, it, it's, it's already blowing my mind 
you know, like a kid in a candy store, there's so much out there to choose from. What do you choose? I find myself not so inclined to go go to any of these airports because I'm not operating airliners yet, and as a result, I'm not operating to these major airports as much. Uh, I'm I'm mostly doing FS economy flying, and it, it goes to a lot of the smaller airports, and because the flying you do in FS economy is based more on where the loads are. Here comes the sun. Uh, I'm not visiting the big airports very much, so I think that uh, you know it, that money spent on large airport scenery would be a bit of a waste at this stage of the game until there's a few good airliners out there to fly. But um, to go back to you know what my YouTube channel's monetization is for, it's going to basically be for um, just promoting this hobby. Any money that I make through YouTube, at this point, the plan is that it's all going to go right back into this hobby. Um, and I think the first time I do get um, a payout from YouTube, for those of you that don't know, YouTube doesn't pay out till you make at least $100 on the channel, and then it pays out. It'll pay out at least once a month, but you have to have at least $100 in the balance before they'll pay you out. At the rate I'm going, that's not going to happen for s many months. And that's fine. I'm not trying to, but uh, what I am trying to do at this point is commit to the first uh, $100 payout that I get from YouTube. It's going to be donated to various... Uh, groups that promote uh, flight simulation uh, just to help offset those costs and keep those groups up and running. So first top of my list, because I use it on an almost daily basis, would be SimBrief. So SimBrief is going to get at least a portion of that first uh, payout that I get from YouTube. Uh, the next ones after that, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm still, you know, on the fence about it, but I'm probably going to donate some money to my VA, because I don't think I ever have, and I've really enjoyed it. Canadian Express is a really good VA. Um, it's not crazy restrictive on what you're trying, what they're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to, you know, on, on trying to trying to rank up all the time, uh, you know, and complete certain flights per month and whatever. It's, it's, it's a very easygoing airline. It's got a nice set of airplanes to fly. Um, it's got some really nice tours, uh, and I really like the tours that they've got going on. Um, but, you know, obviously, even running a VA that's uh, very low-key still takes up server bandwidth. Uh, you know, there's, there's all sorts of overhead costs to running any kind of virtual organization. So, they're, they are kind of second on my list. Third on my list, um, probably at this point, would be Sim Toolkit Pro again, a, a fantastic tool that's doing a lot out there. Getting a little stuff on the weather radar there. A uh, fantastic tool that's getting a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of useful tools, and I'm making a lot of use out of it. My whole logbook is now engaged in Sim Toolkit Pro, and I really love their logbook function as well. Um, as much for the tracking here, 334 flights in the last probably year and a bit that, that I've been tracking flights that this logbook has kept track. 334 flights, 1,100 hours, 373,000 miles, and I just love this map feature here that just shows all the flights you've done and just sort of, uh, you know, you see what you've done, what's been popular. I, obviously, I love crossing the pond from, from North America to Europe, um, and I've done some longer haul ones as well from the west coast of, of North America over into Europe. Uh, I've done my whole little Alaska FS economy uh, legs and just a whole bunch of miscellaneous legs over mostly North America, occasionally over Europe too. Really neat. I really love this. This feature is fantastic. Uh, you know, and then even here with up to Svalbard uh, up in northern uh, Norway, Sweden. Oh, I can never remember which country switch. Sweden, I think. Anyways, I like. I also think this is a really great feature. And yeah, look at this. It's nine percent. So th this does show you. How how you're doing in your current flight? I love that. It's really neat. Even just because even just even if you don't have the flight progress screen up, it's got just a little kind of just a little just a little icon there with with the progress on the icon. Constantly improving features here on uh, Sim Toolkit Pro. So that one also. But uh, yeah, my first my that, that's my plan right now is my first payout. I'm going to give it right back to the community to the people that have given freely to the community. And then after that, I'm going to use that payout just to offset the cost of purchasing add-ons and. At the rate that I will probably be monetizing YouTube and I'll be earning money on YouTube, it's not going to add up to much uh, for me. Uh, I'm still going to probably be putting in more of my own money than I will be of the YouTube money, just trying to, you know, just just picking up add-ons that I'm interested in, especially the airplanes once they start coming out. So, 
thank you guys for watching the YouTube channel and, and contributing, and uh, I'm trying to keep the ads reasonable. Um, one thing that does bother me, uh, you know, uh, with YouTube ads, I don't really like the overlay ads that appear on the bottom of your screen uh, when you're watching a video that appear on the bottom of the video, block out the bottom part of the video. I don't really like those, so I've, I've disabled those on all of my videos, I think. I, I have to go through them all individually pretty much to turn on uh, ads for each one. So it's taken me a while to go through them. Um, any video that's less than 45 minutes to an hour, I won't have any middle of the video, mid, what they call the mid-roll ads, so where the video stops halfway through and you watch an ad. The only ones where I'm going to have those enabled are going to be these long ones, these pilot live streams that are an hour and a half, two hour, three hour videos. And then I'm going to limit them at most to three. I'm trying to keep the advertising very reasonable. I'm also going to tend to space them out a little more. One thing that I found is a bit odd with the algorithm is that the YouTube algorithm automatically looks for places to place ads in the middle of the videos where there's like a break where you where the video suddenly changes and there's a drop in the audio. So like this, where you switch to an outside view and the video suddenly really changes a lot, and especially because I stopped talking and the audio went down for a second. It's going to probably detect that there as a great place to place the video. The trouble is a lot of that happens in the first 15 minutes of the video when you're doing the setup and I'm kind of going to the outside view a lot in the first few minutes of my videos. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to have you watch an ad before the video comes on, watch seven minutes of video, and then have another ad come on. I hate that. I hate that. So I'm trying to keep the ads uh, reasonable. I'm also uh, not enabling the ads that... Uh, trying to disable the ads where you have like one of those little title cards that po pops up and that normally people use them to like, hey, link, watch my other video because I referenced it here. Click on the link to watch the other video. But they also will have ads in those cards. And that bugs me as well because it looks like it's kind of coming from me and I've set that up and it's, no, it's actually just an ad. So I don't, I don't like ads that, uh, that disguise themselves in a way as non-ads. So I'm trying to keep my advertising somewhat minimal on the channel have the pre-video ads. I also am not turning on the unskippable ads, so you also have the option to choose whether you can have the skippable ads that are skippable after five seconds, or whether you have the ads that you force people to watch for the entire 30 seconds. Um, obviously, to the advertisers, the 30-second ads are more valuable, so you make more money off YouTube from those ads, but uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to, you know, think as, as a YouTube user as well. I'm trying to put myself in your shoes, guys, and I don't want to force you guys to watch 30 seconds of ads prior to my videos. I'd rather have you watch two, two short 5 second clips, cl click skip if you want to, and then and then into the videos. I don't want you guys to be watching long videos, long ads before my videos. So I've tried to keep my personal ad policy reasonable. And, and, and kudos to YouTube for giving you control of that as a creator. You can choose how you want ads to be displayed in your channel. I appreciate that, YouTube. I'm going to take advantage of that. I'm going to going to really turn off the ads that I don't like because there's lots of things that I don't like out there with the way advertising is handled sometimes but I have turned on ads and it's there it, it is there it's not going to make me a whole lot of money because I don't have a whole lot of people watch this channel in the grand scheme of YouTube it's going to make hopefully enough money that over time it'll offset some of the money I spend in this hobby and that's about it so that's my justification to you guys for watching ads any money that you do any money that you do, um, you know, like I said, any ads that you do watch, it does make me a little bit of money. It's not much. It really isn't. Uh, each time you watch an ad, it contributes maybe a penny to my bottom line, if even that. Uh, fractions of a penny to my bottom line. Uh, all that money is going to go back into the flight sim community. So uh, keep that in mind when you're watching them. Uh, you know, I'm not making, I'm not making a living out of these ads. That's for sure. I have to still make a living outside of YouTube. Uh, these will just offset the cost of this hobby. That radar is really shifting quickly here. I guess Active Sky is probably throwing more stuff out there as we go. Alright, uh, we passed Sifu already, did we? I didn't even notice we passed Sifu. Now it's a long way to our next fix. What's our next fix? Frickle? Where does it say it? Uh, oh, no, there it is. Yan uh, Yankee Alpha Yankee. Not sure what that is. Maybe like St. Augustine, North Shore of Quebec? I'm not sure. Uh... Check. Uh, there's a couple different ways you can check. Uh, yeah. 
let's go and do this. Uh, I'm going to do it on Navigraph here. I'm going to pull up my Navigraph charts here and just have a look at where we are ahead of us here. Yankee Alpha Yankee. Oh, it's on Follow Me. Let's so turn off Yankee Follow Me for a second here. Yankee Alpha Yankee is St. Anthony on uh, Newfoundland there. That's what it is. Okay. And then we'll be offshore after that. So at this point, guys, I think I'm going to take a little break from the stream already. It's a little bit earlier than I normally would. I'm going to come back sooner than later. Right now i got no ATC online. In, oh, I do have Gander online a little bit, so I'm going to have to get some pre-oceanic clearance from them. But I've also got a few other things I've got to do this morning. Uh, so we are going to step away for a little bit here. Uh, I will come back probably about a half an hour. Uh, yeah, we're about a half an hour away from getting into uh, St. Anthony. And once we get around St. Anthony, we're going to start talking to Gander. So... Yeah, uh, we'll give them a shout in a little bit. In the meantime, guys, uh, thank you so much for watching the channel. I'm going to go ahead and put this on the external view. And actually, one thing I forgot about before I do that, uh, I'm going to just take off my track IR here for a second. Get my beautiful cinematics going externally here. And i got one more thing I've got to turn on here, which I forgot about. So give me one second here. If I can just think about what I'm doing here. I need to refill my coffee because I'm already my brain's already starting to run on empty here. just going to do that for one second because I need to pull up one thing here. And that's what I was afraid of. There we go. So we're going to be back at about uh, before 12 Zulu. So I'm just putting that bumper up right there. So again, thank you guys for watching. Come back around 12 Zulu. We'll start with dealing with Gander. And uh, yeah, we're on our way over to Nice. First hour is done and we got a couple hours still to go. But uh it's going to be fun. So there you go, guys. We'll be back in a little bit. Thank you.
Hey guys, Captain Nabs back on the flight deck here with you, and uh, we're just going to take a couple minutes here to give a call to Gander Radio. So uh, we're just coming up to our oceanic entry point here in the next little while, and before we hit that, we should be calling Gander for an oceanic clearance. We're getting there a little faster than I anticipated. That, that tailwind is picked up. we got 128 knots behind us, so it's even faster than I had uh, expected. So we're a little bit ahead, so I wasn't quite ready for it, but we're going to give him a call before we get to Rickle here. And, uh, yeah, uh, let's see here. We're going to do Mach 8, 2, 3, 5, oh, yeah. Gander Radio, Gander Radio, good uh, morning. It's Transat 648. Transat 648, Gander Radio, pass your message. Gander Radio Transat 648, we're looking for the Oceanic Clearance. Uh, requesting uh, Nat Track Yankee, flight level 350, Mach decimal 82, and we're currently estimating Rickle at uh, 1158 Zulu. Yeah, A firm, we'll take the random routing for Transat 648. Transat 648, Oceanic Clearance, Gander clears you. Gander clears you to Nice. Gander clears you to Nice via random routing, recal 53 North 50 West, 53 North 40 West, 53 North 30 West. 53 North 20 West, Mallet, Gisty, from Recal, maintain flight level 350, mark decimal 82. Okay, Gander Radio clears Transat 648 to Nice via uh, random route, uh, Rickle, 53 North 50 West, 53 North 40 West, 53 North 30 West, 53 North Zero West, and then Mallet and Gisty. Uh, maintain flight level three five zero and Mach decimal eight two. Read back correct. Contact me overhead to recall for position report. Return to domestic. And uh, Gander, uh, we actually just passed over Rickle halfway through that conversation, so uh, advise ready to copy the position report. Ready to copy position report. Thank you very much, Transat 648. We crossed uh, Rickle at uh, time 1158 uh, Zulu. And uh, Mach decimal 82, flight level 350. Estimating 53 north, 50 west at 1215 Zulu, 53 north, 40 west thereafter. Really hard to see those small numbers on there sometimes. Six, four, eight. What was your thereafter waypoint again? Sorry. Uh, thereafter waypoint is 5-3 north 4-0 west. We should have called for the clearance a little bit sooner. I did not realize we're making such fast progress today with that 130 knots behind us now. Um, so uh, I, I, I underestimated how much time I was going to need to get back to the flight deck to be able to get that clearance in there. But uh, there it is. So whenever you enter oceanic airspace, uh, just like domestic airspace, you have to get a clearance. However, the, form, the, the format is different, partly because um, 
in oceanic airspace, first of all, it's an un, it's a non-radar environment, so you have to get a clearance for a non-radar routing, uh, and it's managed very separately from the domestic airspace, so that's why everything happens on a different frequency. If we had done this properly, we would have switched to the oceanic frequency, gotten our clearance, you know, 20 minutes before we got to Rickle, switched back to the domestic frequency until we reached Rickle, where the domestic airspace ends, and then switched back to oceanic to do the position reports. Of course, with the position, with uh, the oceanic clearance, one of the important things, and people don't seem to know this, is that you have to request everything. So oceanic has to validate everything that they see. They'll get a copy of your flight plan, but they need to validate it. So you need to ask for everything specifically again. So you need to specify the route you wish to take. You have to specify the altitude and the Mach number that you wish to fly. Um, partly to validate what's in the flight plan, partly to validate any possible changes. So if you've had to change uh, altitudes, due to weather, turbulence, whatever, or, um, you know, you, you've changed your Mach number slightly because the cruise, proof, cruise profile is different from what was originally filed. Those things especially need to be, um, need to be verified. So uh, that's why when you're initially calling them up, you give them all the information again, the routing you want, the, um, in this case, he had it on file, so he all told me what it was, and I just Gander, confirmed it. All stations, Gander, Gander Radio, online for five more minutes. And then he's on offline in five more minutes, anyways. Um, yeah, so what am I trying to say here? Yeah, so you've got to usually give him all the information that you want. He will he will check it against the other traffic in the NAT system. So um, make sure that there's no other aircraft that are flying close to you at the same altitude along the same route. Uh, if you're flying the same altitude in the same route, then you've got to be a certain number of minutes behind each other, and you've got to be flying similar mock you've got to be flying the same mock numbers or you've got to be flying mock numbers that will ensure that you don't lose separation so if the one the aircraft behind obviously is going slower than the one ahead that's okay if the one ahead is going slower than the one behind the one behind is going to catch up to it then you need additional time spacing at the start of the nat track to ensure that you don't catch up before the end of the nat track so that's the whole part like a gander um, well, the oceanic sectors, more than the domestic sectors, are more about overall traffic flow management, and it's done procedurally, it's just looking at, analyzing the information, making sure that based on all the information everybody's provided, nobody's going to collide. Because there's no radar to tell you exactly where everyone is, uh, it's just based on these position reports. And that's why the position reports are also important, because there's no radar, it's a check to make sure that everything is happening according to plan. If the winds are not quite as forecast, if your speeds are not quite as forecast, uh, and then things shift over time. Uh, you know, every 45 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes, you're doing a position report. It's a chance for uh, the oceanic controller to validate that what that the plan, the separation plan, is working. And if things are coming apart, if things are ending up too close together, then they can adjust things as you go, uh, adjust your Mach number, perhaps get you to climb to a different flight level. You know, whatever is appropriate. So, anyways, that's uh, that's basically what we're doing here. So, in about 15 minutes, we're going to cross 53 north, 50 west. At that point, we would have to make another position report. Uh, in this case, it may not happen because Gander sounds like they're going offline very shortly. So, unless somebody else comes online to pick it up, uh, we're going to be without ATC again. But it was good to do that, finally. I don't think I've done that. So, uh, I'm going to step back out of the flight deck again for a little while here. I might be back for the 5350 north check-in if there is anything happening there. If not... Then we'll definitely be, be back um, by uh, a little after. We'll say quarter after, uh, quarter after the next hour. So uh, right now it's what 12, 12:05. So yeah, 13:15. We're gonna try to be back online no later than 13:15 Zulu. Uh, just get to uh, get a couple of things done in this world to get the day started. And once they're up and then we'll be able to focus in again more on what we're doing here on, on the flying. But that's okay. We've got uh, about two to three hours of oceanic flying ahead of us. Probably about three hours of oceanic flying if I go here and just have a look here. Uh, we don't reach the exit point until... which is uh, just the 1437 Zulu. So uh, only got two and a half hours of oceanic flying today. At 124 knots. Like, we're doing 590 knot ground speed. We are, we are doing a phenomenal speed here as we go. Uh, but yeah, so we're, we're, as I said, I'm going to step out again for a few more minutes, uh, well, a few more minutes, another hour. We're going to have a nice big long chat uh, when we come back the next time here. Uh, got lots of stuff I want to talk about, some of, the, some of the things going on in the flight sim world, and uh, also 
Uh, of course, coming up not too far in the distant future is Cross the Pond, and we'll chat about that and what's going to be different, some things to look forward to with the next version of Cross the Pond. So, uh, thanks guys for watching. Stay tuned. We're going to be back in uh, a little over an hour, and then uh, we'll we'll have some more uh, cruise chats here as we cross the ocean. So stick with me, guys, and uh, we will see you in a little bit. All stations, Ganda. All stations, Ganda. Ganda Radio closing. Monitor Unicom one two two days more eight. Bye bye. And I guess we should switch to Unicom since he's offline again now. But at least we got the clearance in there. And then we're gonna step away. <laughs>